Welcome to the Haikyuu Q&A after season four. First question, Will Butler, were you a school athlete at any point? What sports did you enjoy then? Do you enjoy now? And has IQ inspired you to become more involved in sports? I wish. Are you more interested in volleyball? The only official sports I've ever done happened in high school. It was cross country team in the fall of my freshman year, which I actually dropped out of because I just hated it. That like fuels a lot of the animosity that comes out in reactions for running. I just found it really ungratifying and I severely injured my knee. But I did return in the spring to do cross country and I I've completed the season and raced in borough-wide competitions. My team actually was great. I think we, we won a lot of medals that year. <laughs> I didn't really contribute to any of that because I was kind of in between. Like there was no great spot for me. I wasn't really good at the the longer distances, like the 800 or 1600. So I was put as a sprinter, but wasn't quite fast enough. My main race was the 200 meter dash. In hindsight, I really wish I had gone after a more uh, team sport. Like those are the sports that I enjoyed to, to answer that question. I've always not always. The sports I've enjoyed the most have been football and basketball, which I've played just with friends. I'm from New York City and basketball is everywhere. There's a basketball court just on every corner. And I feel like getting good at basketball is just part of the social experience growing up in New York. But in that regard, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. My birthday is December 29th. So growing up, I don't think I was naturally incentivized to play sports because I was physically small until about 16 or 17 compared to my peers. I can never remember the book. I think it might be Freakonomics where they, they posed the hypothesis that people with late birthdays are less likely to get involved in sports precisely due to that physical disadvantage that comes at a young age because you know when you're 10 11 12 up to you know higher teens a couple of months makes a huge difference in your physical stature so it really wasn't until like 15 16 that i i'd say i really started to love sports but by then i don't know i feel like that ship had kind of sailed in terms of academic official sports i think one of the greatest experiences of my life was for a long time my my friend group and i organized a tackle football game during thanksgiving break which i think we did for like 10 consecutive years like long after high school Those those were really big events and we would do it like interborough. So we would do Bronx kids versus Queens kids, etc. That was a lot of fun. These days because of my schedule and because I just think in general, sports are not really as natural a part of life for adults as they are for, for kids or teens. I haven't really pursued it. I would like to, especially after watching IQ. Like I've been really thinking about joining a league, but it's just so far it's been relegated to the domain of thought. I am definitely more interested in volleyball though. Actually, because of Ryan who has sent me videos of the national Japan team in recent competition. YouTube has been like taking cues and has been feeding me volleyball content, which I've been watching. I definitely had slept on volleyball. I didn't realize what a beautiful sport it was. And thank you. I mean, I think it goes without saying that it increased my my appreciation for the sport as a whole. I actually do happen to know a group of people who regularly play volleyball as part of a, I guess, a recreational league. I'm tempted to reach out and ask them to join. But again, it's just one of many things that I really want to do, but haven't gotten to yet. And I think while I, I definitely rely on, on physical activity, like I think it's an important part of my mental health. Right now, going to the gym, kind of occupies and satisfies that that spot test account says build your roster of seven players that's this is hard all teams all four seasons and again huge shout out thank you to ryan for providing this this list because it would have been tough for memory alone given the individual positions i'm going to give you kind of an easy answer that is my genuine answer but then i'll give you a more interesting answer i honestly would pick just Carsono because well i mean i just love them that's really it and they obviously work together they're winning <laughs> Uh, so it's proven to work. They also just seem like a great group of people to spend time with and train with, which is probably, you know, 99% of how I would be spending my time on a volleyball team. But if I'm going to do a, a Shiro Torizawa type recruitment, just like forget anything except for just victory. For Libero, I think I actually am going to go with Nishinoya. I think he does seem like the best to me out of the people we've seen. Also great team spirit, great attitude. He kind of has it all. For opposite hitter, it, it's, it feels blasphemous. It feels, it hurts me to not say Daichi, but I think the choice here is obvious and that is Ushiwaka for obvious reasons. Middle blocker, again, it's really hard to avoid Hinata. I get all the arguments against him. Height's not there. Rough around the edges when it comes to talent, but like, man, do I not want to bet against that guy? If not him, I probably would go with Kuro. We've seen he has a very high level of skill. Suki got a lot from him. He's got experience. He's on a winning team. He's a great mentor, and I feel like that's that's really useful on a on a team. Wing spiker, Tanaka. There's no secondary. It's just Tanaka. Tanaka never misses. Setter is really tough. There's a lot of great setters. Again, Kagami the obvious choice, but my backup secondary. I think I'm gonna go with Oikawa. If nothing else, just for his drive. I want people who are a little bit hungry, you know, who have a chip on their shoulder. And because he fills seats, you know, the guy sells tickets. And finally, coach, I, I want to say 
Nicholas coach, but while I love him for this, and he's one of my favorite side characters for this reason, like he understands what's important, he's a little bit too, like too blissful, you know, like I was just saying about chip on your shoulder, you want a little bit of an edge if victory is the only concern. And so for that reason, I'm actually going to go with, I mean, that's weird, the Shiro Torizawa coach. The guy is a proven champion. He knows how to win. He knows how to get things done. He's got his personality foibles and hangups, but I mean, especially the, the new, new coach, like where we are in season four, you imagine he comes out a better person as a result but he still has those killer coach instincts. But again, this is just an alternate to my 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 real heartfelt answer is Carcino. The show establishes why they are what they are and it's a combination of all of them. It's no accident. You know, it's not just because of the protagonists. They're the protagonists because what they're doing is right. Bruss019 asks, Tanaka's cross spike versus Suki's block. Which moment was better? <laughs> Ryan says, Hinata, did you see my receive? Man. It's very close. All peak moments. Right now, sitting here looking at this question, my, my first instinct is Suki's block. And the reason I'll give it that edge is because while all of them were inspiring and, and show underlying corresponding character that is gr way greater than just volleyball. The reason I'm going to say Suki is because of how reluctant he was to give it his all. How many emotional obstacles he had. There's something I relate to in that so strongly where you're keeping yourself at a distance from something that you, you actually really care about it because you care about it, because of the fear that that creates under the guise of being above it, like some kind of premature sour grapes. A lot of people stay there. And Suki, by actually engaging, by actually starting to, to get drawn into it piece by piece and giving a little bit of extra effort here and there until it kind of built up and broke past his defenses, is a risk, right? Because now you're finally entering into a domain where you could be proven right, like your, your fears could be confirmed that you're not good enough that you will just be disappointed, you will be a laughing stock, et cetera, et cetera. But like that journey is such a fundamental one, I think, to, I mean, me personally, but I, I think probably to a lot of people, where you're crossing a threshold into like an adventure. In doing so, you're inviting in pain, like you're literally opening the door to things that will hurt you deeply. But at the same time, you're opening the door to like a better version of yourself and like the sweetness of life, new plateaus for yourself, actually caring about things, engaging in a meaningful way with things bigger than yourself and getting whittled down and shaped by that no matter how difficult that is. So to watch all that and to see him figure it out, right? And also to do something no one has done before to like transcend what other people had done and then to let out that scream of joy was like the ultimate reward for me watching his journey. And I'm sure a lot of viewers feel the same way. I think I've wasted so much time and energy and maybe still waste time and energy because even knowing the problem doesn't make it easier to overcome the problem because it's just so difficult. Kind of pushing things to the side saying they're not important or that I don't want them or I don't need them or oh, there's better things to do when the real obstacle is I actually do really want them on some level. There's something important there for me but there's this massive fear of the undertaking because of what it will mean to make that kind of contract with the endeavor. Maybe part of the insidiousness of this is that there is some validity in that thought like there might actually be things that are more important but it's kind of neither here nor there because it's calling me right things are calling you and they're there for a reason it's probably like a one of the next necessary steps in growth or at least it's one of multiple things that could contain that lesson or steps for growth but that wears on you because even if you don't know directly like it's not in your at the front and center of your consciousness or you're doing your best to hide it from yourself you you feel it somewhere like it's there it kind of eats at you it creates a, a tension that needs to be resolved that is not healthy long term. You can easily imagine a scenario for Suki where he takes this kind of ethos or his approach that he had early on in IQ and broadly applies it to everything in his life where he gets to stay secure in kind of the self-identity he's built and what he thinks he's projecting, yet is always like the child Suki that we come to see in the beginning of the show. Tanaka's cross spike is, is really inspiring, I think partly because of who Tanaka already is. You know, he's he's just there and his quote is so profound and so interesting. But like he's Tanaka, right? He, he's been Tanaka. Of course, it's growth too, but more than Suki, I feel it's just kind of shining a spotlight in more intense focus than what we've seen up to that point, where Suki's shift is radical. I think you could actually add a lot of moments to this list. Haikyuu is filled with moments. One that I don't see mentioned, it's kind of small. It's not even really covered. There's no real dramatic focus put on it, as far as I can remember. No inner monologuing. I think it's in, in the same game with Tanaka, where Kageyama like, runs to the other side of the court to save it. Something about that stuck with me. Doing something that just about everyone else would have given up on, and like saving the play. Undead Desk asks, that's a hard one <laughs> to say, if you could pick three characters from Haikyuu, who would you want to be a mentor, be mentored by, or just great people to be around like honestly all of them should be my mentor because <laughs> i think haikyuu what, what makes certain characters great what makes a lot of them great is something that i feel i'm very deficient in i've actually been thinking a lot recently about how i never really developed mastery in anything this was i think a line of concern i guess 
that started from March Comes in Like a Lion, or at least developed in more extreme intensity from March Comes in Like a Lion. Those who know the show and watch those reactions will know I'm talking about Burning Fields. There's some things I, I value so much about in my life and my composition. I think I've been able to already live a life beyond most people's wildest dreams. I've experienced such a range of things and activities and people and adventures that I wouldn't trade for anything. There's a, a gap though and a limitation to that that I'm now thinking about, which is that it's a lot of horizontal movement. It's like really cool horizontal movement, but it's horizontal movement. I feel a little bit, I won't say trapped, but limited in, as far as vertical movement goes, at least up to this point. I could turn that all around, of course, but I think it's natural to, in some part, envy is not the right word, but it's like a positive kind of envy where it's recognition of greatness, skills that actually reflect your weakness. So one thing that I'm really drawn to is people who like, they know what they are and they know what they like and they know what they do and they just crush it. Like they just give every ounce of effort and resources to that pursuit and they become like kings or emperors of that field and they can bask in the glory of that. That is so cool. It's like another path of life that's different from mine so far. But man, is that awesome. Like whatever it is, like the, the older I get, the more I look more at like the traits of that than the actual field itself. So, you know, some fields are more interesting to me than others. But if I meet someone who's just really great and passionate at, at one thing, it's like immediate respect, 100%. In that light, one edge, one thing that I could take away from just about every Haikyuu character, or at least the greats, and especially Karasuno, is they know what they are, they know what they like, and man, do they, they give it 100%. I mean, looking at Hinata, like the dude lives and breathes volleyball. To a degree, I honestly don't think I will ever experience in anything, even my favorite hobbies. So right off the bat, there's a lot for me to learn from just about any one of them. To go to the pinnacle of that, I mean, well, I guess I have a split answer. If you've watched all the reactions, you, you know very well by now that one of my best mentors in life is a Kita type character. So I feel like actually that is the best fit for me, but at the same time, I've already sort of had that. That process versus results thing was something I needed to hear. I needed that outlook. I needed to be around someone who was really well composed and who just always naturally won everything. I feel like I, I've incorporated that into my personality, into my outlook as much as is possible given my base stats and have tremendously benefited from that. So the question would be more like from here on out. So Kita would have been a prime contender before. Now it would be like, what's the next step or what's like the biggest efficiency I could get or could improve on? And going Going along with what I said previously about like that mastery and and the, the focus and the seriousness furthermore I would probably go actually with Ushiwaka. Ushiwaka is a great mentor because there's no room at all for wavering and wavering is my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> I am someone who drowns in possibility and ideas and chaos and what I could get the most from is like seriousness, ruthlessness even towards a pursuit. Ushiwaka is a terrifying, terrifying light that shines on all weakness and it would be maybe the most difficult mentor to have but for that reason or, or I think that's actually a, a, an extension of why he would be such a great mentor for me or for anyone for that matter. I also think at earlier stages of my life I might have said Daichi maybe when I was a little bit more lost in terms of my, my personality or a little less sure of who I was because because Daichi has that kindness to accompany it. But now that I think I have, you know, enough of that myself, I'm pretty self-regulating in terms of my emotions. I definitely don't waste as much energy as I used to doubting my worth or doubting what I can do. The ruthlessness is kind of appealing to me, actually. As for who I would mentor, I think it would have to be something outside of the domain of work ethic, probably dealing with something more like self-doubt that some of the characters experience. I think I could be helpful for that. I'm also fairly confident I could help Tanaka get a girlfriend. All the hard work is done. I mean, he's just a great person. Just needs a little bit of smoothing out the wrinkles. Could I help him get Shimizu though? I don't know, that's tough. Who I'd like to be around? Definitely Daichi. Tanaka, again. <laughs> Tanaka might be featured in all my answers for great things. Off of Karasuno, this might sound like a very odd choice, but I'm gonna say Tendo. I like his brand of craziness. I like that he's a little bit different and unorthodox. He feels like somebody where you could go interesting places with and not be hemmed in by, you know, just social niceties and conventions. I like a little bit of wildness in my friend friends and my interactions where you can go off the rails a little bit be a little bit risky and you know that it's just kind of play and it's, it's experimentation and, and no one takes it too seriously back to Karasuno Sugawara is just really nice he seems like a pleasure to be around like I don't know I can hang out with anyone from Karasuno Tsuki would be a very different energy but it's an energy I can tap into and it's an energy that would be fun to tap into not a volleyball player at all but also Karasuno I would love to hang out with Yachi she just seems like great friend really sweet also not a volleyball player 
love to go drinking with Tanaka's sister. Nekomata's coach. I, I feel like it's just I'm too old, maybe. I'm like leaning all towards the the older older people. Oh, definitely Oikawa. That is a playful energy that I love. Not Mad Dog. Guy, looking at this character list, it's sad. It really is kind of true in a way that, you know, you only remember the winners. The brutal realities of sports and therefore life, insofar as it's a competitive arena. I'll also say Atsumu. Again, partly because of the just the fun, the playfulness, the cheekiness. It's such a great and well-written cast of characters who actually feel like good people. I mean, just to give a very short, simple answer to the whole thing. Basically, any of them that aren't underhanded, manipulative, unnecessarily childish, or like too cold. Suki being an exception because he makes up for his, you know, outward iciness with being very witty. <laughs> so Jeremy Ocasio asks, my thoughts on the way it looks like they're going to release the remainder of the story in animated form and if I'll read the manga. To be perfectly honest, it took me a while to realize how important each moment of Haikyuu was. So many of the payoffs happen late, like they really take their time. So if you had asked me in season one, I, I might have said that they, they could cut it down somewhat, but I'm way more reluctant to say that now, seeing what I've seen. I think actually Haikyuu does best. It does, does such a great job, partly because it's a lot to breathe. So it, it does concern me a little bit that they might cram the remaining material into a couple of movies. That being said, you know, just to try to look at it optimistically, I'd rather get something than nothing. That's one. I imagine it'll still be great. I, there's There have been times, I think, in my media view, viewing experience where I feel like that rushed thing actually benefits the storytelling. One example of that is one of my favorite anime of all time, favorite shows of all time, Evangelion, where they famously, or at least this is the way I've heard it, had expectations for a lot more seasons, but were forced to kind of conclude the entire story they had envisioned in the last five or six episodes. But man, those five or six episodes are some of the most gripping episodes I've ever watched of anything, you know? So it, it is possible that it ends up being great. Who knows, right? I'll take whatever it is. And in the past, like with certain shows, for example, My Hero Academia, while I'm not a huge manga reader, I definitely am open to reading individual chapters of things that are left out. Like I read Vigilantes, for example. I want to know the full story. I want to get everything that the author had to tell. And I'll do my best to like get as full of a picture as I can. As for the channel, I don't know about YouTube, if it's movies, because I honestly, I've to just totally given up doing movies for YouTube. It's just way too much of a headache. Anyway, it doesn't seem to work. doesn't seem to stick because of copyright, but it will definitely be on Patreon. There's no way I'm missing those. Migs asks, what character spoke to you the most personally? And if you had to compare yourself to a character in the show, which and why? As I often do, I'll give you the cop-out answer first, and then I'll give you more, more specific answers. The cop-out answer is... I think part of the power of the show and the power of Karsuno is them as an ensemble. I, I mean, I could go through so many of the characters of Karsuno one by one and, and mention how they spoke to me. Tsuki for overcoming his fear and committing, like I spoke about before. Tanaka for his grit, for the way he overcomes what he perceives to be a weakness and turns it into a strength. Kagama, maybe similarly actually, in danger of being crippled by being himself, him putting his natural ability into the world, his natural disposition into the world, getting hammered for that and suffering, yet finding a way to recalibrate, not by swinging to another extreme, not by totally avoiding it, but by taking the feedback from that and returning to his base self, his natural self, and harmonizing those elements so that he's an even better version of himself than he ever was before ever could have been. Daichi for his vision, you know, for plugging away despite pain, and for his ability to keep up an overall goodness despite all of that. His genuine love of other people, his service to others, his ability to put the weight of an entire team on his shoulders spiritually, the way that he deals with pain, suffers through it quietly, but with the confidence and with the ability to overcome it so that it's not a, actually a drain. He can shoulder the burden, and so he does shoulder the burden gladly, without ever a negative word to anyone, except as it's absolutely appropriate and backed by the, the necessary requisite love. Nishinoya for being so dependable and, and spending so much of his energy on service to other people. Asahi and a lot of other characters for having almost crippling self-doubt, but choosing to participate. And for being a central character in the idea of live and practice to the peak of your ability and not hold anything back. And of course, Hinata, the sun, having a passion and a joy so great for, in this it's volleyball, but like I'll make an extension and say life or endeavor that Nothing is wasted and it's just pure living, but also for his ability to reflect and his ability to make painful decisions. Some of my favorite moments of Hinata come from his difficulties where he realizes that in order to progress to the level that he wants to progress to, because of his deep love for the sport, he has to make a sacrifice. He has to give up something temporarily. He has to give up the, the success of the quick, for example, in order to make a better quick. I think the general vibe Hinata gives off to a lot of people is being kind of young and immature, a little bit rash, chaotic, but 
that is to me a sign of immense maturity one thing that comes up for me consistently in discussing each individual character is is partly why i think they work so well as an ensemble is that they're they're united in in certain key ways and one of those ways is the way they process and deal with difficulty and adversity some people seem to lack any kind of self-doubt i think that's that's either a total illusion that you know we perceive from the outside or it's just a very lucky rare thing what's cool about Carsono is we get deep dives into their psyches and even the the most naturally positive joyful members of the team like Hinata for example have their struggle but critically not only do they not let those become or at least stay obstacles they become fuel for growth one thing a good friend said to me a long time ago that always stuck with me is that negative emotions are a powerful force if they're a wind at your back typically things like fear self-doubt uncertainty they are headwinds right like they just make it harder to act, to make it hard to do anything. The impulse is just to run or run away, fight or flight. It's a really advanced skill that a lot of the characters possess, where they they take their fears and they put it behind them and use it as fuel. For example, Tanaka, right? I mean, there's this fear of being average, but well, his answer is, if if I actually am average, if I actually believe myself to average, I have no time to waste. Therefore, wallowing in this, looking down. Like imagine every negative thought you had, every moment of insecurity, fear, embarrassment, whatever, could be turned into something that gives you strength. It's a skill I think can be learned and, and practiced. It's just very difficult. But Carson is such a great emblem of, of that process. It's a huge reminder to me of like how I spend my energy and what I let get in my own way. Back to Kagayama, he can be a little bit stern. He's a little bit cold. He's a very serious person. He's a human being with a heart. And what happened to him in, in the pre-high school days kind of broke him because he was being himself. Everybody resented him for that. You can easily imagine most people or a lot of people who went through that for a very long time at least, reacting to that by just perpetually walking on eggshells, not being themselves, being too afraid to impose their weight in any way, even if it was productive, or the opposite where they just double down on their negative traits and don't learn anything, become more cold, become more ruthless, blame everyone else. Kageyama took what was an obstacle and like really brooded on it, really struggled with it. But of course, that's not the end. He watched himself in conjunction with his goal and he played around with it until he found this seemingly near optimal point where he, he is who he is. He can exhibit his skills and his strengths, but he's also incorporated the feedback of his painful lesson. Most people's initial reaction to Hinata in the volleyball world is that he's too short. For some people, that would just be a non-starter. Like, I'm too short to play volleyball. The end. Hinata not only is undeterred by his height, he has a drive to surpass the limitations others may impose on him in his performance. And Like, I feel like it makes him work that much harder. Actually, I think I am just going to stick with that cop-out answer because that's, that's how I feel. There is no single person that is like the most profound to me. That I think is part of the power of the show. If I had to compare myself to a character, though, I would, and hear me out on this, <laughs> in terms of some of the philosophies that have been put forth in the show, I actually would compare myself to Hinata, but in very specific ways. So it's it's not in the, the drive for mastery of one thing. I differ from him in that. It's not the unrelenting sunny spirit. I don't have what he has in that regard. I'm thinking about it specifically in his kind of will to go out and play, to take risks, to potentially embarrass himself, but to follow that instinct. One really great example of this that just immediately resonated with me, even though it turned out to be somewhat of a controversial move across the, the general audience, or at least that's how I perceived it, was him showing up to the training camp, despite not being in Invited. That's something that I would do because if I'm gripped by an idea that is that is compelling to me, I'm okay with the concept of falling flat on my face. And especially as it's put forth in the show with this idea of like playful experimentation versus structure. I'm not Kita. I'm definitely more on the playful, chaotic side, and just in terms of my natural disposition. Relatedly, I was just listening to someone talk about decision making in a way that really resonated with with me and and how I feel I've been sort of unconsciously approaching things. The person was talking about making difficult decisions that have negatives either way and that in that process he will look for which negative outcome he's less likely to be able to live with. And that in many cases what that is is the regret of not trying. You can go for a pursuit and you can fall flat on your face and that will sting. But would it sting worse than that lingering question, what if I had believed in myself? What if I had just gone for it? 
the answer for, for that person, and I think often for me, is the failure is way more palatable than the question of what if I had tried? You know, what if I had believed in myself? What if I had shown up? What if I had taken that risk? And those decisions to just go for it and take chances and, and like live kind of at the edge of your ability or out beyond your skis is even better and more powerful when it's done from a place of of real interest, a real pull towards that thing that, you know, like I've argued many times, it's probably something like destiny because it's it's very connected. It's totally determined by what you naturally are, where you came from, and where your potential lies. Hinata is someone who plays with his heart on his sleeve, and while there are many differences between he and I, that is one thing that I, I connect with very deeply. Or, <laughs> alternative answer, whatever team that was that was just playing around too much, because <laughs> that, man, that that's me too. Too much playing. I do love to play around. One of my struggles this year and currently is, man, there's just so much temptation for me in Korea. There's so much fun to be had at my fingertips. It's been a struggle to kind of rein that in a little bit to make it a little bit more healthy, but it's much more satisfying to compare myself to someone like Hanada. It spares my ego a little bit. Malik Pra asks, what philosophy explored in the show so far do you want to incorporate into your daily life and way of thinking? So I've already spoken about a couple of philosophical concepts. I'm going to try to take a, a few of them and condense them into one and also refine them. This one to start off is an area of deficiency. I mentioned before that my approach to things has been sort of scattershot and it's been following a lot of interesting things and, and having fun and playing, but there's never been any one thing I've dedicated my full being to like the characters in IQ to achieve mastery of, of any sort of thing. Now, earlier I said that all of my movement has been horizontal. It's not totally true. I mean, there's been a lot of horizontal things materially. I would say where the vertical growth is has, has been spiritually. Like as I experience things, I learn and I grow and I become more and more developed and sound as a, as a human being in ways that really matter. Where I feel like it's not happening, where there's no vertical movement at all, is material. And here's the trick, like I mentioned earlier, one trick of that Suki flaw, initial flaw of like, well, I don't care because it's not important, is that it, material actually isn't perhaps as important as the spiritual, right? I would argue. But, but there's a level past that where, okay, it doesn't matter. It is more important to be a well-rounded, solid, decent human being with like a good, robust thinking core. Okay, fine. That That is what it is. Let's make that the main pursuit. After that comes the harrowing thought. If that's really your base, there's no reason not to also do the other things that improve your life in other ways. It turns out that rising vertically in the material sphere of life, and by that I mean like money, status, power, recognition, accomplishment, etc., while not being the end all be all of life is definitely something useful that I could use and enjoy as like a person who's like enjoying life, right? I could certainly do a lot of good even with those things to add kind of a active arm of the spiritual, but it's been hiding itself under the guise of it doesn't matter. But the truth is, if I'm really honest, I do want those things. So mastery is something that I now have to contend with. It's been kind of an existential struggle for me to figure out what that looks like for me, what it would be, how to improve my my just material, physical lot in life in a meaningful way so that I can live the life I want to live and do the things I want to do and, and critically help the people I want to help. That is an area of improvement. And the passion that the characters of IQ show for volleyball is like a, a taste of that, that that I hope to emulate. Like, man, does Ushiwaka shine a light on me <laughs> and Kagama. I mean, so many of them. Hinata, for that matter, despite me just talking about my similarities with him. That drive and focus to let the things that do not matter truly slide, to quote Fight Club, and to single-mindedly pursue whatever that current stage of life is without distraction, without negative sentiments, though they will definitely emerge being an impediment to that growth. On that note, I think Tanaka is, is a great example. My average self do I really have time to look down? Yeah, I mean, I waste a lot of energy still, despite everything I said about like taking leaps. It's still there. Having negative thoughts, negative emotions create more work than there needs to be, if that makes sense. Additionally, I think one of the most interesting philosophical explorations in the show is this kind of duality between like the, the keto side of things where it's you do the right things, you follow the right process, you believe in the process, and you just know, you, you just trust that you will get exactly what you need. Versus, I guess, what would be like a little bit of craziness, a little bit of a radical edge, an untapped wildness that can sometimes break through rigid structure. It was so interesting to watch this in IQ because it's it's a concept that I've been thinking about and discussing with friends for a very long time. I think IQ's answer is something like, it, it's not one or the other, it, it's both in conjunction, and there are there's a higher spirit connecting the two of them that that makes it work and that higher spirit would be something like Hinata
time. If you have enough of the right qualities, if if you're awake, your eyes are open, you're able to change, you don't let obstacles stand in your way, but instead use them as fuel. You have a drive, you have a hunger, you have a joy, you have a passion, you have a burning goal. You can't really get it wrong. It seems like the case of many roads, one path. Hinata initially relies on his freak natural abilities, his passion for the game, and his instinct. And that runs its course, and so he returns to, like, education, to learning structure. And that catches up by the end of Season 4, where he's a team player. He understands, finally, on a much deeper level, the, the mechanics of volleyball. And he still has that explosiveness, the wildness, the unpredictability. There's actually a parallel you can make with Aang. He's this free spirit windbender, but he's got to be more than that. He's got to be the avatar. And what that requires is learning the different methods and philosophies of the other elements, including those that are opposite to him, like, you know, Toph and earthbending. You have the goal that's bigger than yourself and that consumes you. And if you're paying attention and you're open and you're willing to like break yourself down, whatever is like the biggest deficiency will, will close. You'll fill that gap. I mean, I can easily think of examples of perfectionists crushing it and chaotic people crushing it. And interestingly, I can think of examples where perfectionists totally crash and burn and fail because of their perfectionism and where people who are wild and chaotic crash and burn and fail because of their wildness and chaoticness. So I guess it's the question of what's the goal and then can I keep learning? Can I keep myself open? Can I can I be critical of myself? Can I let go of certain things that I'm attached to for fear of, you know, the structure that they've given me so far or the success they've given me so far? Can I go back to basics when appropriate? Can I take crazy risks when appropriate? How do I find that that sweet center where I'm like in harmony with the, the journey, if that makes sense? Skylar Anderson asks, what is the biggest surprise about the show to you? Did you come in with an expectation and was that met or exceeded? I didn't know that a sports anime could be this engaging. I mean, I never know what a show is before I watch it, right? You hear about the, the premise and you draw conclusions prematurely based on that premise, but it's never really the premise that matters anyway. It's going to be what is underneath it and the, the truth value that it contains and the applicability to human life in a way that's real. It was no different with My Hair Academia. Like, on the surface, it looks like just a goofy cartoon. It is so much more, <laughs> obviously. This time I went through the same thing, but with sports. It's about sports, but it's not about sports. It's about games. The biggest of which is life. And you can take any element of IQ pretty much. I mean, there's a lot of technical details, but you know, that's fine as it builds the tension and drama. But of course, underneath all that is heart and truth. Also speaking about the show from its early episodes, I really expected it to be more of the Hinata and Kageyama show. And in some sense it is, but I mean, it really isn't. Like they're absent for long stretches of time during episodes, at least in terms of like the, the real focus and the show doesn't suffer at all. The fact that it can pull off an ensemble cast to the point where even you even like the rival teams, right? It's, it's pretty amazing. As difficult as it was for me sometimes to keep names straight, it was worth it. Daniel Cunningham asks, what are your favorite characters or moments from every other team that isn't Karzuno? I keep coming back to Tendo. I think out of a lot of non Karasuno players, for some reason, he's stood out to me a lot. I mean, he's another great example of somebody taking what could have been an obstacle, you know, a crippling obstacle, and turning it into strength. His flashbacks were, were really sympathetic, and I think showed a great deal of character strength, continuing to be himself and finding a pursuit where he could apply himself meaningfully. I also love, like, I think the Ushiwaka Tendo pairing is, is so intuitively perfect for reasons that are hard to even describe. Also, I can't think exactly of specifics and which team it was. I think it came up more than once. But I really enjoyed watching other teams lose, and not because of the obvious reason of just like gloating and happy Carson to advance, but because of how they process the loss. The loss, I think, from experience, it finally sends home. It gives you a clear picture that you can no longer avoid of what you weren't doing areas in which you let yourself slide, these little ways you could have done more, and also your faulty reasoning behind that, you know, thinking it doesn't matter or, eh, I've done enough for now, even though, you know, you, you don't really feel satisfied with what you've done. The weakness is taking grip, sort of. There's an honesty and strength in that reflection, and I think you see those characters use that as renewed motivation for the future. And, you know, the good news for them is even if they're no longer able to play high school volleyball, the lesson is, is equivalent or applicable to just about any arena. It has something to do with like having a clear lens on yourself and your own inner psyche. How well can you identify your own excuses? It's not easy. Bonbon53 asks, who is a character that you warmed up to eventually, even if initially you weren't too fond of them? Stupid, sexy Oikawa. <laughs> He's great. I understand why people love him. It was frustrating to... <laughs> play against him. I would put Atsumu in the same category. He's initially kind of grating, but once you get to know him through the game, he's not a bad kid at all. He's just kind of cheeky. And I would put Suki in that same 
category. He's he's rough. He has a very, very strong entrance, a striking entrance that's just kind of rough. In fact, I feel like they backed off of that a little bit, almost thankfully, as the series went on. He's, he's not really as grating ever, I, I believe, as he is in the first couple of episodes, where he's just really in your face, aggressively antagonistic, as opposed to later where he's kind of passively <laughs> antagonistic and picks his moments and is not necessarily in people's face about it. Once I came to understand where it was coming from and, you know, what some of that aloofness was and seeing what he can do and seeing him give his all to the game, it turn into love and also then you appreciate his wit. Ryan asks, in contrast to other series where there's basically one set of background music tracks, Haiku's soundtrack continues to evolve each season and thank you to you for pointing out the evolution of some of these themes like Baby Bird. It definitely enhanced my appreciation of it. Does that make any difference to the viewers and is it worth it? The first thing I want to say about this is that it is 100% clear to me that music can make or break a moment. I mean, maybe thankfully it has more power to enhance than it has to destroy. There's something about like the right soundtrack, as everyone probably knows and feels, that could just push a moment times a thousand. To that effect, I, th I think it's worth it. And I, I mean, I think the evidence of that is that there's a lot of people who appreciate Haikyuu soundtrack immensely. That being said, and I, I don't know what it is because I'm not naturally that musical. There was a mistake I think made somewhere with Q, and maybe it's like my headphones. I don't know. It's not the music itself. The music is beautifully crafted and, and composed. I think maybe maybe it's just the volume or how prominent it is or the mixing or something. Because you know, in comparison to to My Hero Academia, which has the same composer for for a lot of it, I don't remember the the music as much when I think about scenes. Whereas in My Hero, I I do. It, it like plays in my head. Don't know why that is. I I definitely don't think. It's the quality of the composition because both are phenomenal. Like when I listen to the Haikyuu soundtrack separately, it's amazing. Something happened and I don't know what it is. But to your question, I th I think because music is so pivotal, it's worth going extra on, on score. And then in the end, what characters do you think qualify as geniuses? The big genius question. I really think Kido was onto something profound with his speech in this regard. There are a lot of things that are initially posed as genius by the show, or at least as like just the, the desirable things, height, obviously one of them, natural ability. The problem I think with that definition is it doesn't really give you anything to work with. What I think actually speaks more to someone's genius characteristics or positive traits or like what I would bet on are the people who are able to dedicate the, the most energy to the things over which they have control. And so in doing so, they they push themselves to the edges of what their, their bases allow and beyond. Somebody who's really naturally talented and just amazing right and just is that way and and achieves success are they a genius maybe in some sense but not in a way that's really satisfying to me and i don't think that's really the, the thesis of the show or, or what kita was saying genius to me implies some kind of what would you call it agency maybe over life the ability to consciously grip the world and and wrestle as much as possible over from just raw circumstance into your actionable experience. And so there are a lot of things, a lot of traits that would fall under that category. And there are a lot of great examples of people who do that. So it could be like Atsumu, who I believe Kira was talking about in that speech, who tries one through 10 and sometimes 100, but also A through Z. That's him really meeting the world and applying himself to it in, in ways where he can grow. Under that definition, I think, I mean, so many characters match. And even if they have different ways in which they, they attempt to seize that control or maximum control and growth from, from the world, they have that at least as a commonality. Not a Kagama definitely, Daichi definitely. I mean, think about Daichi, who's kind of depicted as as a just sort of middle of the road player technically or ability wise. He never really gets any super athletic focus, but look what he created. I mean, he put the whole existence of Karasuno on his back, had a vision, created the, the emotional center of it that allowed other people to join that had different talents, keeps everyone focused, doesn't let the image or branding of the so-called fallen crows be an impediment in any way to their success, understands and applies his role to the, the best of his ability, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and the result is something greater than anybody ever could have anticipated. And, and for me, that's a much more satisfying answer to the genius question than it would just be like, he's just naturally good, or he's two meters tall. Ushiwaka, a genius in a different way. I mean, he's, he's naturally talented, that's a given, but that's not what makes him Ushiwaka. What makes him Ushiwaka is him seeing an opportunity, being dead serious about it, and having a, a vision, I actually think vision is a key part in this genius thing as well. Being able to recognize lanes that the one can like willingly travel, his lane being 
brutal work and unrelenting power, you know, towards what he's doing. Oikawa would fit under that definition as well, because while he doesn't view himself as naturally talented, does he not push himself to the, the limits of what he could possibly be? There's this weird thing that I've been, I've been struggling to tease apart for a very, very long time, where it's like there's a point at which you're awake and there's varying degrees of being awake. It's a never ending process, I think, for everyone in terms of the depth of that. But I think there is a crucial line that you have to cross before which you are kind of living on the, the current on which you were born and you're not that far away from like a deterministic life. There's like this big bang that, that can occur. Maybe it doesn't happen in a flash, but it can happen gradually over time where you realize or begin to realize just how much of your own life and your being and doing is in your own hands and can be crafted by you in very meaningful ways despite the realities of your circumstance or maybe even in harmony with the realities of your circumstance. It's not an easy place to get to and like one of the, the, the tragedies I'm trying to grapple with and figure out a solution to is how do you get people beyond that point? It almost seems luck based, right? Like before that point where you're developing yourself, you don't know you can develop yourself. So how do you develop yourself to that point? There's like this weird closed loop paradox thing happening. And I think there's a, a lot of debate in, in natural societal discourse about how responsible people are for, for their own lives and for especially their misdeeds. The argument being, well, if people are born into a certain set of circumstances, then they were just on rails and we have to be sympathetic to them. And I don't like that argument because of what it implies. But like, this is the one area, like the awakeness versus non-awakeness thing where I can't really offer a counter to. I don't think it's your situation. I don't think it's your, your base circumstances. I think the real question is whether or not you have that spark or that, that big bang, from which point on everything you do is in your own, in own hands. But then again, that kind of creates the solution itself where it's like you just treat everyone as being fully responsible and, and fully awake. You demand the awakeness. You spread the message of awakeness and you try to get as many people there as possible so that everyone has their own life in their own hands and can push it to the greatest extent that they possibly can to be the best selves that they can without being stuck in, in what seems like just a causal stream. That's a very, very zoomed out, non-volleyball, non-IQ answer. But there's something in there to me that connects to the idea of genius. It's like, how far along that, that path are they? What are they doing with what they have? At what point of acceleration on that curve are they where they are maximizing the extent to which their, their lives are actionable, understandable, applicable, etc. And what do you think is the main takeaway of the whole fluke discussion? Wow, did Hinata get lucky a lot, <laughs> like a lot, every season, every game. <laughs> Total luck every time. There's a parallel here with that saying about how if it happens once, it's situational, circumstance, whatever. If it happens again and again and again, it's you. And that's for both good and bad, right? Like if there's a pattern that emerges in, let's say, interactions with other people, people consistently have the same reaction or things play out the same way over and over and over again. I won't say it can't be other people. Maybe there's some kind of large misalignment. Maybe you're the only one who's doing things right and everyone else is wrong. But like, there's something about you in there somewhere, right? It must be. Like, what's the constant in that situation? It's you. I, I guess to separate those two things, it doesn't necessarily mean what you're doing is wrong. It does probably mean that there's something about what you're doing that will continue to get the same outcome and you have to make of that what you will. Whether it be just accept that that's the outcome and be true to what you feel you are. Or I would argue probably more likely realize there's something you're doing without realizing it, something you don't actually mean to do consciously that you would be better off perhaps not doing and then altering your behavior. Same is true with positive things like People would love to call others gifts, luck, timing, and blame it on a whole host of superficial, let's say, things. And maybe that's right sometimes even. But, you know, if you see someone continue to grow and continue to have success, very, very good chance there's something right that they're doing. Hinata makes things look like a fluke because he's so spastic. But I think the skill underneath all that is the fact that he's able to instinctively put himself in like a general range of things being salvageable and then because he's unafraid to like take huge risks and shoot himself out there has good reflexes and never gives up like the there's a little bit of it that is just in the nick of time and it has some element of luck in it but he's had the skill to put himself in that range where the the edges of his luck will meet something actionable if that makes sense like foot saves right okay he didn't play it perfectly but he was there, right? Like he was close enough and that part of it I think was skill. Just because something isn't clean, just because it's messy, doesn't mean it wasn't done with some degree or even a large degree of talent and skill. This is perhaps only tangentially related, but it comes to mind because I was just having this debate on YouTube about Vinland Saga actually where somebody was arguing that uh, the universe and life itself is just absurd and the 
point I made is that there are a lot of absurd things in life, but there's kind of a parallel here with randomness in the sense that there may not actually be randomness. Randomness is often just a word we assign to things when we can't accurately identify either a causal link or what goal it was attempting to address. But just because we can't attribute a cause doesn't mean there's no cause. That's a very different thing. In that sense, very few things are actually random. Very few things are actually absurd. And very few things are actually flukes. KP asks your top five quotes from the show. So first I'm going to give you my gut answer and then I'm going to cheat and look some up. <laughs> the one that I, I find myself repeating to myself that really stuck to me as a quote as opposed to a concept because there's many concepts I took from the show, obviously, is Tanaka. And if I'm average, how can I continue to look down? I'm, I butchered that, but I would say not quite a quote, but Kita's whole speech about genius, I thought was excellent, really well done. Also not really a, a, an impactful moment in itself, but a great quote when viewed as a whole and what it's connected to. Damn, who was it? Tsuki, that one day he'll have a moment. Was it Kuro or was it Bokuro? I'm a little bit confused because I, if I recall correctly, they were both there for that. Ukai's line Volleyball is a sport where you're always looking up, not only because of the significance of that moment, but also because of the, the meta significance of that line. Hinata's just one more, and, and as I mentioned, I think that's a line that's going to continue to grow in significance as the series goes on. It's such a simple quote that so beautifully captures so much of what I love about Hinata. God, I'm, <laughs> I'm cheating and reading quotes, and there are just so many hits. Both Kagama and Hinata saying, as long as I'm here, you're invincible. Come to think of it, both the final statements of Ushiwaka and Atsumu, something along the lines of I'll see you later, <laughs> I guess, the mutual respect that that contains. Oh, of course, at the end of the, the Alba Josai loss, Takeda Sensei, that speech. <laughs> I don't even remember this, but bathroom is a place where you meet dangerous people. That's a good one. I'm a libero. I'll guard your backs with my life if I had to. It's so dramatic, but also so Nishinoya. I feel a little bit guilty reading these, but I think just the way I process things, I remember concepts more than details like obviously names and specifics it definitely sunk in it got in there even if i don't remember the the origins but reading these there's something about reading quotes that gives you like a renewed or different perspective on it that, it, that sometimes is superior because it's isolated it's just just the word no visual just just the the words themselves reading these it, it's like hitting me how deeply interwoven these ideas are and how profound they are. Chris Sharp asks, what do you want to see from the future from each member and who do you think will get focused later on? To give a very general answer first, I want them all to take the hardest, most productive road because I think that's the spirit of Haikyuu. I want to see them all triumph over themselves, whether that means a victory in this tournament or not. I want them to walk away from this, win or lose, with no deep, long-lasting regrets about what they didn't do, which I don't think is a real risk, risk for them. I think they'll be rewarded for their outlook and effort, win or lose. And they may even win. I, I like, it's hard for me to predict. I actually think a lot of whether or not they win this tournament has to do with what the author has to say about the other teams. Barring the tournament, I'm actually really hopeful that the series, at least in some capacity, covers their future careers. Like, I want to know where they end up. It's a lot to ask, but I really want to see Hinata end up in, like, a professional volleyball capacity. Even if he's not a, a starter, it would be nice to see him be able to continue to get to play or be involved in some, some way that's meaningful to him because of how much he loves the sport. Certain characters, I think, are a, a lock for future volleyball, like Kageyama. Tsuki could, it just depends on him. I suspect a lot of members of Karasuna will not go on to a professional career. Maybe they'll do a college career, but that's okay. I, I think their greatness is kind of universal to any pursuit. Like I can see Daichi just crushing whatever he does. I want to see Tanaka get a girlfriend. <laughs> I don't care if it's Shimizu. I, I want him to like find someone. There's a growth that could happen there and him letting go. I think there's some things you, you can't win through sheer will. Individually, even though we've seen a lot of him already, uh, there's a lot more we can see from Hinata. I think there's like a, a sharpness or a seriousness he's starting to develop that would be absolutely lethal and would be a pleasure to watch to see him bridge the gap and take that like playful energy, the chaos, the will, the drive, the hunger, and take that and then swing a little bit closer to Ushiwaka. Just be an absolute beast, powerhouse, and also maybe a leader, maybe in subsequent years when the, the upper class has graduated. Speaking of which, I think that'll be very interesting to see how the dynamic shifts once the seniors graduate. Because the, the rookies have two more years after this. I mean, that opens up a whole bunch of possibilities. Thinking about Kageyama mentoring the entering class later is really interesting because of his his demeanor, the obstacles he's overcome in dealing with people. I'm imagining him setting to a whole new class of people, but with enhanced understanding of how to work with people. I think that would be a treat to watch. Hinata also would be a really fascinating mentor. 
once he's a little bit older and more seasoned. Animigi asks, favorite character philosophy? Like I said previously, it's less of a character philosophy and more of a Karosuno combined philosophy, the gift that they all share. Just to expand on that a little bit. And I think there's another question to this extent. Yeah, Athena asks, what's something from Haikyuu that has become more prevalent in your daily life? I've been really thinking a lot about the spirit of how to deal with obstacles, trying to change the framing of them so that they're, they're not bigger than they need to be. They're just obstacles. There's no or not no unnecessary emotional baggage and weight that drags you down. They just are simply things to overcome and approaching that with a spirit of joy and excitement and seeing the, the beauty and the challenge and the struggle and the fact that it, it's a test of will that, that gives you an opportunity to grow. It, it gives you something to practice to form a habit of how you face adversity. Like we see with Karasuno again and again and again, they come up against adversity and they initially stumble, struggle a bit. You know, Daichi has that image of his back against the chasm, yet they are able to push past it and overcome it. And every time they do it, it seems to get a little bit easier because they've been there. They've done that. They've like built that momentum in themselves of, oh, this is a problem. I know I can overcome it. Keep your head up. The loss is not losing the game, but being afraid of the game. It just really got me thinking, how much would be possible and how much easier would things be if I could come at life and challenges with that spirit, with the spirit that the Haiku cast or Karasuno cast have. And it, it's not easy to fake. I mean, in fact, I think you can't fake it. I don't think you can just will your fear away. In fact, I think that's another thing that Haikyuu gets right. It's not focusing on the, the negative, but finding some other place to put that energy into something positive or something you have to do rather than, you know, dive into the darkness and try to resist the darkness, which only makes it bigger. That being said, I think it is something that can be practiced. And so I've been reminded of this again and again because I find myself like going down a, a spiral now and then of like fear and self-doubt. And it's been helpful for me to acknowledge it to some degree. Like, okay, that's that's there. What am I doing right now? You know, where am I going to put this energy? What is the beauty in what I'm doing? Where is the joy in what I'm doing? Look at how beautiful it is that I have any, any opportunity at all that comes my way in life. And I've noticed practicing that thought, it gets easier and easier to stop that, that loop in its tracks. And I know the logical extension of that because I've been there at times in my life and at moments where life just becomes a pleasure. The world seems to crack open and you enter a slipstream where even the obstacles and the challenges are in some sense a joy. And it's hard to maintain that, especially as circumstances and challenges change. But man, can life really be a playground when you can slip into that mind state. Chris Sharp asks, what do you hope to see from the battle of the garbage dump? I'll start out by saying, speaking of predictions, I think Karasuna wins this for sure. For a bunch of reasons. I mean, first of all, I think they were too evenly matched before Karasuna went through all these like top championship teams. This is also a familiar foe that they've played against many times. And the Koma also has grown, but just instinctively, it's hard for me to imagine they've grown more than Karsuno has grown. Though some of that bias is based on what we've seen covered. There's something about the upcoming game that is a victory lap for the both of them. I mean, they're, they're former foes once in glory kind of restored to that status. It's also a very interesting game for the reason that they're close. I mean, Hinata and Kema are friends, right? I'm not really sure, honestly, what to expect from that, but that familiarity opens up a lot of interesting doors. In terms of growth, I think we might actually see a lot of growth from Kenma. The writing has clearly shown some preferential treatment of him and interest in him. I think there's a lot of areas that that he can grow. I'm zigzagging around here, but there was something that came up in the previous game about familiarity, right? Like Kageyama and Hinata block the quick because they know the quick. Well, there are elements of that in this coming game as well, but maybe more so because of how intimately acquainted the two teams are, how well Nakoma knows Karasuno. So what do they do against an opponent that knows their DNA and knows what they can do better than perhaps any opponent they face so far? How do they adapt on the fly to that? Samir Khalid asks, what team banner motto did you like the most? And Ryan again coming in clutch with the choices. <laughs> fly is solid. I think the, the one, this is not my favorite motto, but one that maybe gave me the most thought is one I initially dismissed, which is Iner Inerzaki's We Don't Need No Memories. That ended up being really powerful because of how connected it was thematically and the statement it had to make about foundation and lineage and legacy, which, which very much is a central part of Karasuno's team and a big reason why they won. That was really well thought out, really well chosen. Aside from that, it's really hard to beat Shiro Toyozawa's unstoppable force. Like, man, what a statement. And they back it up too. Poetically, the smallest of streams form the mightiest of rivers is pretty beautiful. And I think Karasuno actually embodies a lot of that saying, even though it's not theirs. Athena asks, if you were in the show, what's your position and why? 
which team would you play for or be a fan of? It's hard not to just say Carcino for all of these. So I'm not the biggest follower of sports generally, but if I take my life as an example, probably I would just root for whatever uh, high school I went to or was in my locality. Because it's fun. You know, it's fun to have some kind of tie. There's something a little bit unsatisfying about like cherry picking the winners. Anybody could root for Shiro Torizawa, right? But I think part of the joy and also the danger of sports in kind of this double-edged sword is the identity of it using the team as sort of a vehicle for for your desires and your passion and outlet for maybe more animalistic but i would say important and in many cases useful to explore impulses and urges the negative side of that that i alluded to is when you use it as a substitute for yourself and over identify and you know say things like we won or make your identity or perhaps your happiness contingent on victory of said sports team in which you don't participate but the fun of it is for a moment you get to escape and you get to watch like gladiatorial combat and i think in that sense the more you can identify with something the more points of interest you have the more fun it is all else being equal so location is just an easy one right if i'm not from any of those localities which i'm not and i didn't know the inner workings of how great some of these people are i'd probably vote for the team that had the best cheerleading squad who would that be inarizaki maybe or for the sport itself maybe the team that's most electric and that actually might be Carsuno. it also might be inarizaki they're a lot of fun to watch i think that's part of the reason why they have such a loyal fan base it's not just their winning it definitely would not be oikawa because i'm jealous of him position i don't think i have the dexterity focus or accuracy to be a setter i think wing spiker might be a good fit based on my still limited knowledge of volleyball i think when i was more physically active and younger i could get up there i could i could spike really well and also i would be very happy playing a role and being a decoy i would be thrilled to be able to do my part although i also really really love the feeling of blocking i mean i've never done it in volleyball but i love defense and basketball so maybe middle blocker wing spiker still i guess anime asks is there anything you disliked about the show names <laughs> just way too many names god there's so many characters. The other thing, and this is not at all a critique, I mean, I think it's it, it wouldn't have done the show or the topic justice if it didn't do this, but it's just a little bit less interesting for me, just given my lens and my approach, is there's just a lot of technicals of volleyball. And I did my best, you know, I tried to be as attentive as possible, and I read all your comments about the, the various details, and I did learn a lot, but it's sort of difficult to like learn all of volleyball in a way that actually enhances my my feeling about the show from just like exposition in the middle of important matches, you know what I'm saying? I actually noticed this a lot during editing, and in fact, I'm grateful for it because it helped me edit tremendously because I need like gaps in between clips when I make YouTube videos. So many plays, so much time is spent like flashing to the the upper the alumni in the stands describing things that just happened i mean it's rarely just that they also provide insight into the sport and kind of make sure the viewer is up to speed on what's happening which i appreciate because sometimes things need to be repeated multiple times for it to really like land especially given all the things that are happening simultaneously in each episode but there's a lot of it and it doesn't always have the same quality or depth throughout all of those instances if you know what i mean the other thing and like this is asking a lot again it's not a criticism it's it's just what i wanted more of and, and that's always a good sign right if you want more is some of the the things i enjoyed the most were moments where they were like not doing volleyball <laughs> they're so rare but so precious because you love them and you like want to see them living normal lives you want to see them doing stuff and just hanging out exploring like their their characters a, a little bit more outside of sport. It was only two episodes, but I, I really enjoyed the, the main introduction of Yachi. I thought those were really touching and I think the show does it really well. And so it would have been a pleasure to see more of that. And lastly, maybe the thing I hate the most is Inorizaki's cheering squad. They never gave us a moment to gloat <laughs> at their loss. I, I guess that's below the morality of Haikyuu, but man, did I have a, a sick desire to see that. Big Head asks, and I already touched on my predictions for who joins volleyball professionally, but players on other teams, I would love to see Oikawa. Ushiwaka seems like a given. Though Ushiwaka's the kind of guy that might pivot and crush it in some other way because Ushiwaka will succeed in whatever he does. He might decide that there's a passion for him bigger than volleyball. I feel like Ushiwaka's drive is not volleyball specific. I think it's just like sheer perfectionism will. Definitely could see Atsumu playing professionally. Some of the bigger guys in Date Tech have a shot. The the guy of unknown height that may or may not be two meters tall if he can get his skills together. I mean, I think it's kind of intuitive in a sense. The, the characters on other teams that are the most focused on, have the deepest dives, are probably all candidates for professional volleyball. And after the third year's leave, not taking into account incoming first years, who do you think should take Daichi in a size position? Man, how do you fill a hole like Daichi? That's not easy. It would have to be somebody 
man. I don't think you can replace Daichi. I think you have to have someone else play his position and hope they're competent. Someone else has to step up and play the spiritual role. And I kind of want that to be a, a combination of Hinata and Kageyama. That I think would be an area of tremendous growth for both of them, given their, their differing dispositions. It also would give them a real appreciation for Daichi. You don't really know what someone's doing or, or fully appreciate the gravity of it until you take that role. Especially someone like Daichi because he makes it look easy. It's like that saying when you do things right people don't know you're doing anything at all. Daichi is such a great example of that. He's doing so many things. He's such an essential piece, but he's so unglamorous about it. Then again, I can actually see some some similarities between Daichi and Yamaguchi in terms of their heart. Like they have a, they both have a tremendous warmth for other people. If Yamaguchi could get a little more confident and toughen up a bit, he might actually do really well in that role. Chunky Donkey asks, has the show given you more appreciation for volleyball? Absolutely. I can't remember exactly what it was, but at some point there was a description of volleyball. I think it was by Takeda or Ukai about the harmony between players and there was like a description of the setter does this and the, the spiker then does this and the libero then does this. There was something so beautifully poetic about that. I was hit in that moment with how much more cohesive and interwoven the team has to be, how in sync they have to be. And, and certain things like going up for blocks, but it's not actually a block. It's creating a lane for someone to do a receive. It's one of those things where you don't really understand the, the complexity of certain things until you, you dive into them. I mean, I'm sure it goes way even, way deeper even than I'm getting from Haikyuu. To play something would be to really know it. But I think watching the show took it from the domain of like an unknown unknown into a known unknown where I, I suddenly can see the, the vastness where I see like this long road, the end of which I cannot quite view. I think before watching the show, I was just sort of under the impression that there's, you know, a couple people on the court and the goal is just to get it up in the air and then slam it down as hard as you can. But it's so much more than that. There, there's so much mental work to it, mind game work to it, thinking about setting pace, reading your opponent, deceiving your opponent, the dishes, the dinks, the dumps, right? Like there's so much to it. Anvik asks, three unexpected favorite things about IQ. Throwaway jokes, recurring gags, or other. And that is <laughs> bathroom mishaps are pretty funny. The fluke thing ended up being a key concept, but I, I thought it was hilarious every time they called Hinata's amazing saves flukes. Two meter tall guy. <laughs> them explaining his height a billion times. How many times Hinata took a ball to the face. And then it actually turning into something that was more than a gag. Their amazement at like a six story building. Refreshing hill sprints was a gift they kept on giving. More significantly, less of a joke. Hinata showing up to the training camp. That's one of my favorite moments. To add on to my favorite moments in, in regard to your first question. There was something so... <laughs> So powerful about that in a, in a way that really spoke to me and really helped me identify with Hinata and made me so proud of him, despite the controversy of, of that decision. This poor kid, like, does everything he, he can, loves volleyball with all his heart, is making these huge strides, comes off of a victory against Alba Josai and Shiro Torizawa, and then just totally overlooked for the training camp. <laughs> And he's just eating it like everyone's rubbing it in his face and then makes a huge decision against people's wishes and just eats some more. Stuck as a ball boy taking abuse from <laughs> Suki and Ushiwaka brutally and uh, the coach and just keeping his head up and like winning, like getting what he needed out of that despite, you know, all, all the odds and what everyone said. Something so great about that. And I think because I loved it so much, because of how it spoke to me, I was initially defensive of him when people were critical. But the more I think about it, the more I think that actually the way the coaches and his teammates reacted to that is actu actually more admirable because of their objections. They understood it broke protocol. They they realized there was a danger there for Hinata, but they also saw the potential and they, they let it happen despite their initial feelings about it, which shows a tremendous amount of care for him and maturity, I would argue. I think that's the kind of behavior that we celebrate in, in theory or celebrate later when people are successful, but punish or are, are more critical of in the interim. There's sort of a knee-jerk reaction to breaking the mold and breaking protocol until it yields results. Then people kind of flip. Josh Stewart asks, while we all want to win, what are your thoughts on the theme of the show truly being just the love of the game? Like Hinata, who just wants to keep playing. Generally, I'm actually a little bit wary of the idea of it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. There is something beautiful in there. There's something true about that, but there's also a potential for it to be misused or for it to be kind of an out or an excuse. In fact, I think we've seen that from some of the, the losing teams. They all want to win. I mean, Hinata, because he loves the game, wants to win. It's hard to separate. I would argue that the, the winning is not the most important thing, but the growth, because this is just a game in a set of games, the biggest of which being life itself. Nevertheless, I think one of the primary benefits of sport is it, it puts you in a very real domain that everyone faces, where it's not you in a vacuum. It, it's you up against very real antagonistic forces in which 
victory or survival, as it might be a metaphor for success is not guaranteed. There are oppositional forces. You can't lie to yourself about anything because it's so outcome specific, which is why I think the winning is sort of intrinsically linked to it. That forces you to engage with it in a way that in order to achieve success, you're, you're actually going to have to adopt certain principles. And those principles are going to be or going to contain some element of actual useful truth in a way that is safe. You know, you can safely explore it. There's no actual death, even though defeat is a metaphor for death. So you're really coming up against like truth in a very specific domain that you can't run away from, you can't hide from, you can't rationalize away, which which I think is the danger, like I was saying about, it's not whether you win or lose how you play the game. No, you have to actually want to win. You need that goal in order to have the test from which the lessons come. There's two ways I can expand on this. One is just the power of experience. The human mind is a very, very powerful thing. And there's a lot one can do individually to develop oneself internally, but it can get a little bit out of hand if it's not anchored to things that are real. And I think that's one of the virtues of experience. You can convince yourself of any theory. You can have any sort of beliefs and that that might be fine if, if like the purpose is self-contained, like the purpose of the belief is the belief or it's something or it's something that helps you get some emotional resolution. But as participants in the world, there are going to be areas where we, we need to interact with external forces to get what we want. And it behooves us to actually take stock of what the game is, what the rules are and what works and what doesn't work. There's a danger of like getting too wrapped up in one's own perception of what things are that is detached from an actual reality. My second point, which I'm already kind of alluding to, is that I, I think there, there are kind of two spheres of life in a certain sense. There's the spiritual, right? There's you developing as a human being. And that can largely be an internal journey. I think in a very key way, even though you might have to travel through a lot of material pathways and experiential pathways to, to get to this, probably the ultimate is, is arriving back at what you already are, but understanding it for the first time, to take that old saying and cliche. I think it is possible to get to a point where you are just your own fully generating source of everything you need. That is difficult to come by and live by. I think just about everyone, maybe everyone, wants certain things from the world, wants certain material things, and you do yourself no favor by pretending you are spiritually ahead of where you actually are spiritually, like denying the material things that you, you feel you want, even though you really do want them because there's some fear about how to get them or some self-doubt or something like that. At a certain point, you probably have to accept that there are things that you want and you have to go out and engage in them to get them. I mean, even if you are just fully spiritually compact and you are your own self-generating source of everything, there still is no, no sense not pursuing certain things, like even recognizing there's no spiritual value. Like, would you rather be wholly spiritually fulfilled without money or wholly spiritually fulfilled with money? You know what I'm saying? As soon as you enter into that second domain, you're in a sphere of like more binary and clear outcomes and possibility of failure and things are not totally in your control. And so the question is, what are the principles that will best guide you through that to, to get you the success that you want in those fields? Sports is such a great way of exploring that. And I think it just so happens that if you actually are getting to the reality of what the game is and what life is, that is when you have the highest chance of winning at whatever the endeavor is. And so it's like, who can best listen? Going back to the idea of genius, who is the most aware, who can adapt, who can change, who can grow, who can see. Hinata's focus on staying on the court, I mean, is essentially winning, right? Like you have to win to stay on. He's so in tune with that pursuit. It's such a fundamental part of, of his being. And I think he feels the growth there for him. I think he has this taste of his own potential. He's in line with that higher calling of, of his own development towards games of life. And so he just enjoys the playing itself, right? But I think there might be something missing by discounting the, the winning element of it entirely. Sorry, that was a huge ramble. That was all over the place. Martin Van Buren the third asks, seeing the growth and training payoff for the team after loss and challenge is one of the most satisfying parts of the show. How do you get yourself into the mindset of tackling a long-term goal without feeling the impatience of wanting quicker results? Yes, how? <laughs> uh, how indeed. <laughs> Please let me know how. I would love to know. I would love the answer to this question. It is a struggle for me to try to give a, an actual answer to an area in which I feel so deficient. I think the, the abstraction muscle has to be practiced. I think one of the biggest obstacles for me has always been a misunderstanding of time and how much I'll appreciate things even as I continue to exist. Like there's such a, a heavy priority on the, the experience you have now in your current state that for some people like me, especially when I was younger, it's hard for me to imagine the utility I'll feel in the future being as good as the utility I could feel right now. And so there's this rush to like get that utility now while, while I have it, you know, while I have youth and while I can still claim that I'm a prodigy of some sort or whatever the case may be. I honestly have never shed that feeling, but what has helped is the ability to understand conceptually at least that, well, okay, I look at my history. As a teenager, I, it was hard for me to conceptualize myself in my 20s. Yet, 
my 20s came and they were way greater than my teens. I was in way better shape to experience the things that I had then. I could not imagine enjoying those same things in my 30s. Here I am in my 30s, things are as good as they've ever been, if not better. And now it's hard for me to project that into my 40s, but like history says, I will be smarter, wiser, stronger, better equipped to handle all of the joys of life. And so it's worth preparing for. That's just the concept though. It's something that requires me to constantly remind myself. It's not easy. Another thing I think really mitigates that impulse is just to really enjoy what you're doing. I don't have many long-term projects that have borne fruit, but I do have some. And all of them were things that I, like I felt I couldn't not do them. I mean, I mentioned stocks a lot. Stocks is something I do to procrastinate, for example. You know, it's not work for me, it's joy. So I didn't need to like focus on a longer term goal. I just enjoyed the moment to moment and it became a long term goal that bore fruit. I did have the vision of it, but the vision wasn't paramount to the process. It was just me doing what I enjoyed day to day for a very long time. I would put YouTube in that category although it hasn't been nearly as long as, as stocks. I now live off of this, but there were two years where I didn't make a dime and that was okay because I really enjoyed the process. I had fun experimenting. I had fun answering comments. I got excited by the feeling of posting a video. It was it was fun to try like new editing things, although I like never try new editing things anymore. It was thrilling to learn like Photoshop for thumbnails because I could connect it to a goal that brought me some pleasure to think about. There are some people that can brute force it. I, I mean, history says, I am not that person, though I think I have it in me. I just, it hasn't been my history. I've definitely brute forced things in the past. It's just like, it's just harder. It takes a lot more energy. I mean, that's Hinata, right? He, he definitely has a long-term goal. He wants to be the best. He wants to win a championship, undoubtedly. But there's something bigger than that, which is the thrill of each individual game. And like, he'll just find himself at that, that goal. And just to play total devil's advocate, I think there actually might be a benefit sometimes in a certain way of wanting quicker results. It's not the end of the world. I mean, I think it obviously can be an impediment if you are skipping essentials to try to grab at something that's just way outside of your reach. It's not bad as a thought exercise, like, oh, I have this very concrete goal. What shortcuts can I take? How can I be more efficient, etc.? It has its place. Perhaps that's represented somewhat by the Mia twins, where they're, they're like a little bit out ahead of their skis, but even Kita gave them credit for sometimes they're at 100, right? There's a time and a place for everything. And you also ask about excelling in one or two things or skills versus being all rounders, which I touched on earlier in this Q&A and is actually a, a topic of great interest to me, especially recently. I don't think there's a right answer. I think it's just important to be realistic about what road each of them leads to. So taking this out of volleyball and into something applicable to everyone, everything, being an all rounder has a lot of advantages like it creates the potential for synthesis. You know, if you have multiple decent skills, you can perhaps combine that into something novel that actually is an expert skill. It also can be really fun if that's your personality, if you just like exploration, if you're naturally suited to discovery, if you have an endlessly curious mind, it's gonna be very satisfying. But then there's gonna be the trade-off, which is the, the skill or the benefit of real mastery, which is the heights you can reach in any one thing. I mean, I think mastery is great for people who just know what the thing is. Like they're so clear in their mind what the passion is. Like in March comes in like a lion with Shogi with a lot of characters in Haikyuu for volleyball. If you know your lane, then like, yeah, give that your all. There's a really cool book called The One Thing on this topic about like eliminating things that are that are not important and really just focusing on one and breaking that down one thing at a time, one obstacle at a time to get as far as you can along whatever the endeavor is that you've chosen. I think with the jack of all trades, master of none thing, you still can reach great heights, but rather than it be endeavor specific, it might be like goal specific. So for example, let's say your goal is freedom. Well, with a jack of all trades thing, you're, you're probably gonna hit on something that enables that freedom eventually. And it may not matter, or I guess shouldn't matter what that avenue is, because you've identified kind of the goal behind the goal, if that makes sense. Whereas mastery, I think, is better suited where the thing itself is the goal. I will say just where I'm at right now, and I don't know if I'll always feel this way, it's just very kind of pertinent to my thoughts these days, just materialistically in terms of like career success and money, I think it is easier to specialize because to receive payment for something, it probably means you have reached a, a level of something beyond what is immediately accessible to people who want that thing. And often that will come with a certain degree of, of dedication. I feel like I'll have different answers to this as my life continues because I really have lived by my thesis for a very long time of take a scattershot approach to life. Really, you know, see what it has to offer. Try a million things. Get to a high level of average, if that makes sense, to kind of maximize that curve before you hit that diminishing rate of returns that's natural with expertise. And like I said before, I wouldn't really trade that for anything. And it's made me who I am and it's, it's provided 
provided for me spiritually. It's been profoundly useful to me in forming who I am and like how I feel about myself. But there are certain elements of my arc in this regard that are yet unproven and, and yet unfinished. So I don't have a final answer to this yet. It's kind of an experiment in progress. I don't know where it will go. I don't know where it will lead me. I haven't achieved my dreams and the more I push myself upwards, the more I come across the limitations of my approach so far. I'm very much right now feeling the, the limitations of my mastery. High level of casual, that's the term I wanted to use. I still have faith in my approach as it applies to me as a person and my natural aptitudes, but it's yet unproven. So I don't really have like a strong base to stand on and like say that it's good, if that makes sense. I hope to like prove it through my actions in the future, but take that with a huge grain of salt. Although thankfully, I think in one's lifetime, it is more than possible to achieve a couple things. You try to take on too much and then, you know, everything gets diluted, but there are plenty of people with real expertise in like two, three, maybe four fields, right? And also it's possible to have mastery and dabble, you know, none of these are mutually exclusive. A lot of it's going to come down to like how you use your time and how efficient you are at learning, et cetera, et cetera. To round out this rambling answer, perhaps it's helpful to identify what the goal is. And barring that, or in addition to that, just having an intuitive sense of what is calling you. That's probably right, you know? Like if you strip away the fear, you strip away the self-doubt, what are the things that make your palms sweat to think about it and get you really excited to do that you can't tear yourself away from? Whether that's one thing or multiple things, it's probably gonna be what you need for that moment. And nothing about like being a jack of all trades, master of none, prevents you from like flipping that and being a master of something when you find something. Anvik asks, how does IQ compare to the other anime you've watched? First off, it's the most specific to a, a niche. Like it's very much volleyball, right? I mean, it's so much more than that, but on its surface, in terms of its episode to episode coverage, it's it's the most of the thing of any other show. Many times during reactions, I've mentioned My Hero Academia, and I feel like there's a lot of spiritual overlap between them in terms of the attitude that Deku and Hinata have, the, the strive to be one's best, given the full truth of what you are, the framework for overcoming adversity, eliminating obstacles in your goals. And so in that sense, Haikyuu is one of the, the most uplifting and inspiring shows I've watched along with My Hero Academia. Also, I would say it's perhaps the most, um, don't misunderstand this, I'm going to say small scale, but I just mean in terms of there's no world stakes, right? Like the fate of the world does not hang in the balance. No one's dying except for the Daiichi scare. And there's something kind of nice about that. It's a little bit more of a human touch, a more day-to-day -to -day touch. I think there's also something special, which I've talked about in previous questions, about the focus on winning, how it kind of forces you into a lane where you have to reconcile certain elements of, of reality. It ends up being a very practical look at inspiration in, in one's like normal human life without like titans and villains etc. As to your point about meeting Haiku fans and becoming friends, I mentioned this during one of the reactions and I still love this. I met a girl at a club that I really liked. Unfortunately she is studying abroad in the UK right now but we bonded at a club over the Suki moment and it was like instant connection. And at that moment I felt the international power of, of this show. Migs asks, where do you see Kenma's art going? Yeah, there's a big opportunity for growth from him, I think, in this coming game. I, I think there's maybe a little bit of, of the Suki thing in him. I mean, I know he cares. He cares a lot about his teammates, but not volleyball. I think Kemba can, ha can stand to have a moment. I think he has more to give emotionally than he's currently giving. I mean, physically, we've seen him lay it all on the line, but there, there's like an underlying joy to the game that I want to see him experience. And I could definitely see Hinata being the catalyst for that. Athena asks, favorite game? Very hard not to say Inarazaki, just because, you know, every game builds on the previous games. And so you see the Alba Josai game in the Inarazaki game. You see the Shiro Torizawa game in the Inarazaki game, right? Some of that, as always, might be recency bias, but that's how I feel right now. I also, I, I would say that although they were initially off-putting, I think I had the least amount of animosity towards Inarazaki during the match. Like, I had a lot of animosity towards <laughs> stupid, sexy Oikawa, and I had a good deal of animosity towards Shiro Torizawa, which, which is partly fear, right? They're, they're this imposing force, might is right. <laughs> sheer, what is it? What is their motto? Sheer domination or whatever. You know, they're, they're an easy villain if you're rooting for our boys. Inarizaki was, was just close enough to Karasuno to have it be like a real fun battle of humans, you know? Sasha asks, favorite relationship in the series? I had never really considered this. And it's interesting that the first thing that pops up in my mind is uh, Kageyama Suki. I don't know why. There's something very understated but nice about their relationship. You know, Kageyama pushing Suki and Suki kind of being a little bit begrudging, but he's there, you know? In their personalities, I think they're they're the two kind of outliers on the team that they lack the, the warmth. They're both very serious, kind of no nonsense, kind of gruff, but that actually makes them a great pairing on the court. I mean, I think the obvious answer and the correct answer is Kageyama Hinata, just because of how much is in there. There's just so much between them, so many beautiful moments of like ignoring and recognition and the, the various mental tactics they play with each other, the competition with each other that drives them forward. I mean, their relationship is just endless, but I also like Nishinoya and Asahi. I love 
that Nishinoya is such a, a strong, powerful kid and defender, yet like idolizes Asahi. There's something really sweet about that. What mascot would represent a team you were on? I've always liked Eagles because I guess maybe because of my American upbringing, the correlation or the connotation of freedom, which is like a very important value for me. Crows are pretty damn cool too, though. I mean, they're very intelligent animals. Definitely a bird of some kind. As for a banner for my team, unstoppable force. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think sports anime resonate with people who have played and never played sports? Well, I think it's because it's not really about sports, right? It's it's a game, but it's a subset. The game of volleyball is a subset of, of much larger games, games of life. It's really the, the mentality and the fortitude and the beauty of the people that shines in Haikyuu, and that's universal. Why are sports anime not more popular compared to big shonen titles? I think part of it relates to what I said my, my initial misunderstanding of the show was, or mistaken predictions, which is that it, it would kind of just be about the sport. And having had no previous interest in volleyball, I wasn't really sure how that would play out. I'm sure a lot of people fall under those same assumptions. But at the same time, there's something to that. Like, I think people can much more easily put themselves in like a hero fantasy hero situation which is kind of weird to say because it's also fantastical but nevertheless i think that's the case hero stories also are grander stakes are bigger and the action itself which i would wager a guess i'm on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of how much i enjoy that or anticipate that have a little more creativity like think about my hair academia for example and all the quirks etc i've come to learn that there are people who, who really just watch shows for like the the action and some people really just like violent things and so shonen will probably win those people over you'd imagine why do you think it takes some time for people to play sonata as one of their favorite characters i think because his personality his gifts are a slow burn and take a while to really bear fruit and shine. One easy first impression of Hinata is immaturity, and there is some truth to that. What's missed is that his gifts and his his natural disposition will make that immaturity obsolete very quickly, but it takes time. At the start of the show, he's like raw potential and not much else. You know, he's all heart and that's it. Of course, you could argue that that is like the most essential thing, but it takes a while for, for that to catch up to everyone else, people who are more mature, more seasoned, more skilled. You also, I think, in order to appreciate them fully, you need to see all of them go through adversity and see how they respond. And Hinata is one of the best examples of how to respond to adversity in a show about responding to adversity. How do Hinata and Kagama rate for you? Do you think the balance of them as partners and rivals works for the story as a whole? Yeah, you need you need both of them. I think what's really important about the two of them is that they have very obvious differences and those differences complement each other. But what's more striking to me is their similarities. And I think season four made that perfectly clear. They are the ones, right? They are the ones who never gave up, who never quit. They have the will and they each having that themselves feed that in the other. And so it's this like perfect combination. Speaking of rivals, why are they so important in our lives? There are a couple things. Firstly, everyone needs purpose. Everyone needs meaning. And I, it's really hard. It takes a long time to be like a good self-generating source of meaning and purpose. We're not naturally very good at it. In fact, I think you can see this a lot in the modern world where people stripped of like really imposed external challenges or goals leads to people leaning on all sorts of weird things. It gets real weird real fast. Arrival is kind of an imposed goal. It's an external thing entering your world that gives you a benchmark. If there's a goal and therefore a scale of progress or winning and losing, it's an undeniable challenge to your level. There's that famous idea that I think bears a lot of truth that's like, show me someone's five closest friends and I'll tell you who they are. Who you surround yourself largely determines your perspective of one, what the world is, what's achievable, how high you should be aiming, what is acceptable to get away with, etc. Additionally, a rival is probably somebody who triggers an insecurity. And a lot of times those insecurities exist for a reason and are very important to address. Without that kind of threat or that kind of reminder, it would be easier to remain in a state of sort of sleep to those those issues to excuse them away or, or not have a, a full perspective on how detrimental they are until someone comes along and like challenges you challenges you in them or defeats you using the the very deficiencies that you know you have but aren't really looking at. It like forces the issue. This is actually a sales line uh, as a stockbroker. They We used to say competition breeds success. Wouldn't you agree? While I wouldn't call them rivals necessarily, I feel like my standards and what I expect for myself have been greatly enhanced by the quality of my friends and seeing what they're striving to do, their ambitions and what they've accomplished. It like just makes you aware of what there is. If I was hanging out with people with like no ambition, no belief in themselves, who just gave it into their vices without any kind of experience to the contrary, I might think that that's just my lot in life. Just in general, any interaction or, or any person that triggers some kind of emotional response
wants is about you it contains a key for exploration that is probably essential for your growth or else it wouldn't like be hitting something right people who are of no consequence to you people whom you've like blown past in any one arena can't really touch you or threaten you they're almost non-entities it's only the people who have like significant things to show you that pop up on your radar so there's a lesson contained in those people they're worth following, exploring, competing against. It also goes back to what I was saying about like why sport is so beautiful. It, it's like testing things about life in a safe microcosm. If you have someone on a similar level with you that you're competing with constantly, you're like doing a kind of arms race so quickly. You go through the iterations of your strengths and weaknesses so fast that I think you get much farther than were you to do it alone through like cognition or just solo practice. This is a very, very low scale example. But nevertheless, I think the, the first time I encountered this principle was like as a young kid playing Pokemon <laughs> because Pokemon was huge on my on my block with my friend group. Like we would get out of school. I don't think any of us did homework. <laughs> Then we would like race to meet and we would battle with our latest teams. And we went through like every possible iteration of strategy that there was in the original Red and Blue. We exhausted that game of its possibilities. And then there was an official Nintendo tournament that I attended and I just swept it. It was so easy. Like people were unprepared for the diabolical strategies that... <laughs> we had come up with just to beat each other. Classic question, favorite opening and ending. It is that time once again in every Q&A where I rewatch the openings and endings. This is weird, but like watching the second opening again, I feel like it's, <laughs> I can't shake the feeling that it's Oikawa like taunting them. I, I know that's weird, but so musically it's close. Like there's a bunch I like. I really like season one opening one, for example, but I think overall I have to give it to the season three opening because music is good, solid, among my favorite songs. But I think that opening really nailed a lot of the imagery. There's some like chilling moments in the way they like transition from Ushiwaka's face to Hinata's face, for example. It especially has a lot more weight for me on rewatch. For endings though, I have a clear favorite and that is season two ending one. It's just my favorite musically. That's really the only reason. And also like the refreshing hill sprints are immortalized in an ending. But special shout out visually to just the very simple uh, like panning shot of the whole cast. In Suki style, what moment are you waiting for in your life? Damn, big question to almost round out this q and A. I I think actually I alluded to it earlier, you know, like I believe in myself. I believe in my process to a large degree. It's just, there's no real like evidence for it. The way I live is very unorthodox. I, I think a lot of people might not understand it. It flies in the face of a lot of conventional wisdom. And, and while I have a lot internally to show for that, I think I would argue, there's like an area of life that's societal in which I don't have fruit yet. And I believe that I will have it, but it's yet unrealized. That's not exactly the same as a Suki moment, but I'm waiting for like that, the victory, you know, like where I can let it out. It will be years and years and years of believing, you know, it will be a very long time of like following my heart with no clear promise of reward beyond the satisfaction of that thing in itself of like following, you know, my, my passion and being authentic to the best of my ability. There is a weakness in there that needs to be addressed. It's not all passion and like tr truth. Some of it is avoidance of difficulty. Some of it is not having learned sufficient skills in certain areas in other arenas or in other methods of approaching life. There's very much still like a childhood thing in me that failed school, not because it was beneath me like I wanted to believe, but because I never learned effective study habits, for example. There's still like an arc that needs closing. As it stands right now, it's a lot of like scattered stories. There's no like narrative conclusion or arc completion yet. When I get there, it will be a glorious moment. Maybe a key element of this or extension of this that is more of a Tsuki style moment. Perhaps it's finding something that I can commit to heart and soul so that there's never any doubt which direction I'm going. There are no more shiny objects. There is just like a sh shimmering golden goal for which I can give my all because I believe I have a lot to give. And last, most important question, how tall is two meters guy? <laughs> I don't know, how tall is he? <laughs> Pretty tall, apparently. So yeah, that is the end of the Haiku Q&A and we'll see what happens with the movies or however they choose to continue the show. Honestly, um, I'll be happy to get anything at this point. And uh, like I said, I will be happy to read the relevant manga chapters or like just the rest of the manga if it never comes out. But yeah, thank you guys so much for recommending the show. Haiku came up for a long time. I mean, I just continue to be blessed by you guys and your choices because like you never miss. While there are like re recurring universal themes through all these shows that kind of solidify my, my outlook on life as well as help me go deeper and deeper into them, there's always something specific that these shows bring as well. They all, they all have a unique voice. Haiku is one 
that I will not forget. There are so many pivotal things in here that I've been reflecting on, trying to take with me, trying to practice while watching the show and even after finishing it. And I hope to carry that with me as, as I move forward in my life. So thank all of you again for watching. And yeah, hopefully we don't have to wait too long for whatever comes next in the Haiku series. <laughs>